Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Humanities Council, a nonprofit, independent state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public. Hi, I'm Bob Dambach. And I'm Barb Gravel. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the people and places that contribute to the arts, culture, and history in our region. On this edition, we'll begin the search for a new conductor for the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony Orchestra. Visit a museum dedicated to the history of Minnesota's milling industry and enjoy the music of a bluegrass band from Thief River Falls. Shelley Fenske compares the art of jewelry making to sculpting. She forms metal and precious stones into one-of-a-kind pieces. Her jewelry reflects her love of nature and her passion for creativity. Found objects and the assembly of things are just such a strong part of me as an artist and what I create. A lot of my work is very primitive. Um, I love neutral, natural tones. Like a piece of amber, it's like when you pick it up, it's just such a warm color and it's got such a glow to it. When you're working with the elements of art and thinking about the color, the texture, the line, the shape, I'm really influenced by thinking about the whole piece and so I'm always um, very conscious of the positive and the negative space. So I'll try to create works where the light can pass through the amber. The stone really drives the design. When I see the stone, I will trace the stone on paper and go from there and start working with a design you know, that I think will accent the stone so that the stone is still the focus. I'm always interested in fossils. I think the first time I heard that amber was actually tree sap. And you know that it can be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. The fact that amber is, is just this precious thing from the past that actually is like this looking glass to the past. You know, and you can see the things that are trapped in it. It's just another part of the beauty and the natural part that I appreciate. I think the fact that I grew up in a small town I was the little tomboy. I was always out there in the pasture, you know, helping them fix the electric fence and get the wiring tight. I loved the working with the metal. I just got so attached to it. So as a kid, I didn't even know that I was, you know, working towards that in my life, but I really see that as being um, a strong influence. Jewelry making is really sculpting in a much smaller scale. You have to make sure that you're thinking about how you're going to hang that piece at the end so you have to do some more extensions on it than you visually would think the finished piece would look like. So you make a pattern. I'll take a piece of just a base metal then, the copper, attach my tracing paper to that and using a saw, just a little hand saw, um, cutting that out. I'm a putzer. I like to do you know, a little bit of everything rather than just kind of sticking to one thing and, and, and continually doing that over and over again. A lot of that comes from being a teacher. Because when you bring it up in this section, it actually goes from darker, because it's darker than this area. It's my 27th year at Glendon teaching. I teach this year six different classes and keep really busy working with lots of different mediums, lots of different processes. Pounce with the eraser a little bit, and lighten those parts up that you need to, and keep it clean. Oh, my students inspire me all the time, and at the high school level, it's always fun to see when they are inspired, excited, have new ideas. If you need an eraser, you need to come on up and grab one. We pulled out a couple more. This is such a crucial part. You can hear it getting 
all of that rough edge off. It's all to the touch. Once you get a, a look that's very smooth, you know that you're finished. I'm planning whether I'm going to have a polished looking piece or an antique looking piece. We need to make the copper pliable so that we can add the texture to it. I always wanted to learn how to do metal smithing, so I spent a summer, took my vacation money and went to Bemidji and, and took a metal smithing class and that's where it all started. Once it's gotten a dull red glow, then you're ready to just quench it in the water. The pieces that I'm working with right now and the amber that I'm working with is fairly symmetrical and very thick. It's like a big, thick amber bead. I love the warm qualities you get with copper and brass with those pieces. At this point, we're going to heat our wire that we're using for the rivet. I love sculpture. I love teaching sculpture. And I really think that that's why um, jewelry making became such an interest to me. Yeah. Sculpting is just um, such a big part of my life. I think I relate to so many different parts of my life when I sculpt. And here's the rivet that I made. I'm going to insert that into here. And the very last part of this is attaching the amber to it. There it is. It's a very rustic kind of sculptural piece. It pleases me and it's my goal to make works that are durable and will last forever. And when I hear somebody that says, you know, this is the one piece I know I can wear and wear and wear and it's always going to be, you know, something that I'll treasure and I'll pass on. I've had that compliment and that, that made my day. Conductor George Hansen has led nearly 100 orchestras and operas, including the New York Philharmonic. He has shared the stage with such extraordinary performers as Yo-Yo Ma and Tony Bennett. Recently, Hansen brought his talents to the region as a finalist in the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony Orchestra's Conductor Search. As someone who grew up here, I treasure my experiences here. I think that the, the, the experiences I had and the people who inspired me and influenced me are the ingredients that injected themselves into my development, my dreams. I went out and I accomplished many of those things. Some of them, I, I, I honestly didn't think that I'd ever be able to, to do them. I mean, conduct in Carnegie Hall, conduct the New York Philharmonic, conduct opera in Berlin and Vienna, and to spend much of my creative life in Europe at the heart of where we think about where classical music as we know it really formed itself. When I saw an opportunity to, to come back here, I, I viewed it as a, a, a real chance for me to, to, to take everything that I had learned and just share it. Just try the violins right there. This is after that little fermata, the Allegramente. I was born in Iowa City, moved to Milwaukee, and then when my father uh, took the, the band job uh, with Concordia in 1967, it was with the stipulation that he be allowed to start an orchestra. I was at Moorhead High School. I had been persuading my parents for years that it was okay that I was only practicing the piano, you know, an hour a day, because I was going to become a, a doctor. Let's play it right at the beginning. Yum, ba ba bum, ba ba bum, ba ba bum, 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 ba. Here is a one, two, three. I remember when I came home as a senior and told my parents that I was going to become a music major at Concordia. They just kind of slumped down in their chairs and were rather saddened by that. I devoted myself um, 
for the next several years to the piano and spent you know many hours every day trying to make up for what what should have been a devotion in the teenage years that I didn't really put forth. I came home one night after I don't know three four hours of practicing 10 o'clock at night I I put on a, a recording without really looking at it it turned out it was Mahler's first symphony and by the end of the first movement I had decided that's what I was going to do I would become a a conductor. I truly have been enriched by my experiences. Everywhere I went, I learned from orchestras. And that's, that's the key thing. It's not conductors going around uh, telling people how to do things. It's definitely a two-way street. And I have to say, it's been the same this week here. I'm learning from the musicians, and I'm really thrilled with how this orchestra has developed over the years. I am truly impressed with these musicians. They are truly dedicated and want to work very hard. And we have been. We've worked uh, extremely hard. They have shown me some extraordinary musicianship. And this, to me, I see as an enormous opportunity. First, Fargo-Moorhead has this tremendous asset in terms of this organization. It's solidly uh, supported. The board works very hard. They have a wonderful staff and these musicians are truly devoted to their craft. I'm grateful that Fargo-Moorhead has continued to decide to support an organization like uh, the FM Symphony, of which you can be very, very proud. After I knew that I would be coming here, they asked if I would um, submit several programs based on potential soloists. I drew up a German program, since that's where most of my second upbringing has been in Vienna and in, in Germany, especially in the Opera House. I did a, a program that featured some American music, and I did a Russian program. Each one could sort of stand on its own, but I also wanted to give everyone an idea of how I might be thinking about a, an entire season as well. You have to look at the program and say, all right, we need a piece on there that everybody's gonna be comfortable with and is gonna say, I love that piece. I'm gonna go to that concert to hear that piece. And it might also be the soloist. I don't see any reason not to have at least one work on a program that's unusual. We have a balance in this program where hopefully a potential listener will come see one piece on the program where he says, oh, I love that piece. So he's, he comes with one favorite work and he'll leave with two or maybe even three. That's the ideal formula, in my view, of how to build a, a single program. The Fargo-Moorhead Symphony is searching for its next music director. This season, our Masterworks concerts will each be led by one of the five finalists. The decision of who will be the next artistic leader will involve valuable input from the orchestra musicians, audience members, symphony supporters, students, and members of the community, including you. The countdown begins. Who will be the Fargo-Moorhead Symphony's next conductor? The Mill City Museum in downtown Minneapolis is a fascinating place to visit. The museum tells the story of the history of milling in Minneapolis-St. Paul and the companies that rose to prominence. Visitors will experience interactive rooms, historical interpreters, and other treats. Plan on a full morning to see it all. It was quite the sight. I sure can't believe it myself. It was exciting enough that schools would bring most of the kids down to watch us start that mill. To me, it's still amazing. We're standing in Mill City Museum uh, in what was once the largest flour mill in the world. When it was built in 1880, it was the largest flour mill. From 1880 to 1930, Minneapolis was the flour milling capital of the world. And this flour mill continued to function until 1965. You have the two companies, the Washburn A Mill, uh, Pillsbury Mill across the river, and here they're both producing flour uh, on a massive scale. Uh, this mill was once the largest flour mill in the world, and then the Pillsbury A mill was. So uh, this is uh, what made Minneapolis the milling capital of the world. Minneapolis, the 
the building closed as a flour mill, and in 1991, there was a huge fire that burned through the building, destroying all the original equipment. And in 2003, this opened as Mill City Museum with a brand new building built inside the ruined walls. The explosive history of this site is that the first Washburn A Mill, which was built in 1874, was destroyed by a huge uh, flower dust explosion in 1878. I'm going to reproduce uh, an event that actually occurred here back in 1878 was the explosion of the Washburn A mill. It's quite likely with the actual explosion that the, um, the ignition source was a machine. I have a nice jar of flour dust here. Put a nice heaping teaspoon of material in here. We're gonna get this dust mobile, and in order to do that, I am going to use this trusty bicycle pump here and get that flour dust moving around in that mill. Let's try it here. One, two, three, go. We're part of the Minnesota Historical Society, so it was the Minnesota Historical Society's exhibit team um, and department that worked on uh, the exhibits here, and they explore a number of different things. One of the big stories that we tell here is the story of promotion and advertising. You have uh, General Mills here, Pillsbury across the river. They're both making the same product. How do they build consumer and brand loyalty? So that, that's a big story, and you'll see our giant Bisquick box, which kind of anchors that area. Uh, we also tell the story of the wheat fields in the Red River Valley that supplied a lot of the wheat that was milled here. Um, and history player Mary Dodge Woodward is one of the ways that we tell that story as well. April 3rd, when the sun shines, such a steam arises from the ground that the prairie looks like an ocean with waves. One cannot make out objects at a distance. The country is alive with team seeding and dragging. We have a large number of school and youth groups that come through here every year, about 35 to 40,000. And they um, experience all facets of the museum. We have an interactive water lab where people can discover changes that were made to the river in order to power the mills. And the key to the whole thing is not to let the water go down the waterfall. So what they did was build a three-sided dam and that actually f raises the water up a little bit more and then drives it to the side where you can run it through machines. We have a baking lab where all sorts of things take place. Our staff will talk with folks about test kitchens, uh, wheat and flour. Flour, hard wheat and soft wheat are turned into the bread flour and the cake flour. And then we have our all-purpose flour, which is generally a blend of bread and cake flour. We also have a show called the Flower Tower, where you ride between seven floors of the museum, each one designed to look like a different floor of a working flower mill, and hear the voices of people who actually worked here. Well, they were just young kids. They wanted to work on the same place all the time. They were boy crazy, too. There is a Meet the Machines exhibit, which is flour milling equipment from the Pillsbury Mill across the river, from the Albany Mill, um, and uh, other places as well. You will also see history players, uh, people portraying people from Mill City's past, and get to enjoy um, stunning views from our observation deck. Oh, is it any wonder that it frightens the animals? <laughs> I never thought I would see the day where work was done by the power of machines rather than by horses. I think for some people, this is their starting point, the go-to for Minneapolis history, but also regional stories and stories of how this place changed the way we eat. You get the strangest dream, and that's into the life in the morning. Oh, I'm all worn out today. She said, why? I had trouble at the mill last night. I think it's something you'll never forget. Get ready for a boot stomp and toe tap in good time with the Woodpicks from Thief River Falls, Minnesota. This group performs a mix of country and bluegrass music that can turn any venue into a barn dance. And each night those swinging doors reach out for me and draw me in. Cause I know each night that I'll come back to wind me up again. Wind me up, turn me on, and watch me cry for you. Make me drinking warm red wine is all I wanna do. 
And I never know how tired I wind me up till I walk in. But I don't care, cause I'll be back to wind me up again. Hi, we are the Woodpicks, and we're, the name is derived from years back when we started playing together. Uh, who would come and play with me, or who would go do this gig? So, and as it came around, Milo came back to town, and, and the rest is history. So it's not the Woodticks or anything like that, ladies wood and gentlemen. Picks. It's the Woodpicks, all one word, W-O-O-D-P-I-C-K-S. Must have a code that you can live by And so become yourself Because the past is just a goodbye Teach your children well Their father's hell did slowly go by And feed them on your dreams The one they fix The one you know by Don't you ever ask them why If they told you you would cry So just look at them and sigh And know that Tender years can know the fears that your elders grew by, and so please help them with their youth. They seek the truth before they can die. Teach your parents well, their children's hell will slowly go by and feed them on your dreams the one they fix the one you know by don't you ever ask them why if they told you you would cry 
So just look at them and sigh And know they love you If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make an interesting segment, please contact us at prairiemosaic at prairiepublic.org. I'm Bob Dambach. And I'm Barb Gravel. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Humanities Council, a nonprofit, independent state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. <laughs>